Hello, my name is Gail Lowe. I'm going to be your tutor on the aromatherapy diploma. I've had 28 years of a marvellous career doing aromatherapy and massage and working with all different types of patients and clients. And I really would like to share with you on this course some of my knowledge, some of my um, experiences and blends and what I found successful and not so successful so that you can really start your aromatherapy with the best advice and knowledge I can possibly give you. So let's press on and teach you some of the basics of the aromatherapy. The aromatherapy treatment is predominantly an effleurage massage. We very rarely would use too much department or percussion within our treatment. But we do use a com combination of effleurage, petrissage, passive movements, department, maybe a bit of acupressure as we sort of walk around the face, you know, finger walk. Effleurage is a sort of stroking move that we use with the flat of the hands. Pressure goes towards the heart. We mould around the contours of the body and come lightly back. Petrissage is a more ringing, kneading, rubbing, rolling, frictioning type movement, which gets a bit deeper than the effleurage and picks up the skin and the muscles underneath. Passive movements are where we might support the body and move it passively. So it doesn't involve the client actually acting out a move. So we pick up the body, we might rotate the ankle, rotate the wrist. That is a passive movement. Topotment is a form of light percussion. It's a sort of um, tapping on the face. So if you tap your fingers on the face to stimulate the nerve endings, that is topotment. Acupressure is where we might um, finger walk around the face, pressure points on the face. That, that's how we use acupressure. We also have records now of the Egyptians using aromatherapy, 3000 BC. They used plants, balsams, resins, aromatic vinegars, perfumed oils, and they used a lot of these oils for embalming and mummification. And when they discovered Tutankhamun's tomb, they found that some of the mummies were still very juicy with flesh and moisture in them. And we can see one of these mummies in the bottom picture. And the sort of oils that they would have used would have been cedar and myrrh for embalming. But they also found jars of frankincense and styrax, which is benzoin. They were found in the tombs by the archeologists. And it's the antiseptic and antibacterial properties of the oils that have preserved the bodies. All along the Nile, there was um, a lot of plants growing and this was known as the cradle of medicine because of the amount of plants that were growing along the side of the Nile. And they were found quite readily to use these bals balsams and re resins for all sorts of different properties. So the Egyptians 3000 BC were using essential oils for lots of different properties. So that brings us up to the present day. And currently we have level two and level three aromatherapists. Level two came about because of the requirement in the spa industry for, excuse the expression, cattle fodder really. So level two aromatherapists can only do treatments under supervision. They can't blend their own oils, so they use pre-blended oils and they work generally in the spa industry, usually straight from school. Whereas a level three aromatherapist can belong to the Aromatherapy Organisation Council and they're insured to run their own business unsupervised. We do blend 42 oils and 19 carriers. And when we're qualified, you can expand that to anything else that's on the market that you like, because there is a lot of essential oils. 
and we call ourselves clinical aromatherapists. And that's the course that you're studying. Aromatherapy is the systemic use of essential oils to improve physical, emotional, and mental well-being. The essential oils are extracted from plants and they possess distinctive therapeutic properties which can be utilized to improve health and prevent disease. I would say that the essential oils are nature's first aid kit. And aromatherapy is not just about a nice smell, it's the therapeutic properties within the oils that are so useful on a physical and emotional and mental well-being basis. Each oil has chemical constituents in it which give these oils a property. If you think of the benefits of digitalis or foxglove and the digitalis which they found in foxglove which is really good for patients with heart disease, the essential oils have chemical constituents in them which if we use either diluted through the skin or we in inhale the aroma of them, those chemicals within those oils affect the way we feel and affect us physically if we apply them to the skin. So aromatherapy's definition is that it is this systematic use of essential oils on the body to change the way we feel physically, mentally and emotionally. So it's a very effective treatment. So as I said before, the essential oils come from different parts of the plant and some come from the flowers, the leaves, the root. A rhizome is a type of a root as well. Some come from the resin, the wood stumps, the fruit, seeds, berries, stems, stalks, twigs and even grasses. So essential oil can be found in different parts of the plant. So which oils come from the flowers? It's chamomile, jasmine, rose. We have two types of chamomile and rose, and ylang-ylang. So we have German and Roman chamomile, and we have cabbage rose and damask rose. Basil oil, also known as osmium basilicum say Osmium Basilicum. This is an aniseedy aroma and the two main chemical constituents of basil are linalool and eugenol. The origin is Asia, Africa, Europe and the USA and basil is extracted from the leaves and the flowers and is steam distilled. Now it has a lot of the family properties, in as much as it's antiseptic, it is antispasmodic and very good for the muscles. But it's also very cephalic. And if we look at our terms of reference on page 61, you'll find cephalic clears and focuses the mind. So it's very, very good for helping you concentrate if you're learning, studying, having basil on a tissue or burning it in the room is a very good assistance to help you remember things. Prophylactic means that it's very good for promoting health. So again, the definition in your book would be preventing disease and infection. So it's a good preventative. A tonic means that it's very good for stimulating and invigorating and strengthening a specific area or even the whole body, depending on the oil. So if you have a look at the systems that basil's good for, that's how it tonifies those systems. It's uplifting and it's also warming. So warming, we're feeling this, produ this production of heat in the body and a feeling of comfort. The different systems that basil are good for is the skin, the muscles, the digestive system, the nervous, the respiratory, and the reproduction. So when it tonifies the systems, it's particular to those different systems. It has a small amount of properties for the skin.
skin, very good for wasp stings, apparently, and acne and reduces inflammation. But it's a brilliant oil for the muscular aches and pains. Very digestive. Most of the herbs and things that we eat are very good for the digestive system. But one of the best oils for depression, stress, insomnia, headaches, AIDS concentration, so it's good for migraines, neuralgia, fainting, fits, neuritis, just to name a few of the things that it's very, very good for from a nervous disability. It's very good for stimulating the respiratory system, particularly for sinuses, and also for reproductive system, especially where people have either scanty or absent periods. And amenorrhea is absence of uh, menstruation. I remember that by thinking, oh, amen, no more periods. But amenorrhea is not a good sign because it means that you're not ovulating properly and otherwise <clears throat> you can have amenorrhea temporarily because you're stressed. But basil is very good for promoting menstruation and balancing and regulating menstruation as well. It's a top note and it blends well with lots of different oils but it can be contraindicated with people with particularly sensitive skin. And also, when you are mixing your oils, make sure you don't have several oils that are sensitive to skin um, that you're blending together. It's obviously going to be contraindicated in pregnancy because of its amenagogue action. And most of the basil these days has had this methyl chavicol chemical taken out of it because it's very toxic. So you should check that when you buy your basil, it's methyl chavicol free. Okay, so we've gone through the 10 common names of the oils in the Lamiaceae family. Now we're going to learn the Latin names and pronounce the Latin names because we do have to call the oils by the Latin names by the time we get to the exam, if not by the time we get to module three. So repeat after me all the Latin names. Ossimum basilicum, Salvia sclaria, Lavendula angustifolia, Lavendula latifolia, Lavendula ex intermedia, Oregonum marjorana, Pogostamon cablin, Mentha piperita, Rosemarinus officinalis, Thymus vulgaris. You have 19 carrier or fixed oils in your syllabus. And your essential oils need to be diluted in at least one of these carriers, if not more than one, to apply the oil to the body. Now, the oils you have are apricot kernel, avocado, castor, coconut, evening primrose, grapeseed, hazel, jojoba, linseed, macadamia, olive, peach kernel, peanut, sesame, soya, sunflower, sweet almond, walnut, and wheat jam. So some of these will be a lot more useful to you than others, and they all have properties in their own right. You need to know the common name, the Latin name, and the family they belong to, any side effects that they might have, like nut allergies, things like that, but certainly the properties that each of them have and why you would use them, you need to justify why you're using them on this particular client when you do a treatment. So there's a few rules of blending when we're mixing our oils and carriers together. And the most vital one of all is that your client should like the aroma. You should like the smell. You are attracted to the oil that you like, and if you don't like it, it's because you don't need it. Three essential oils is the maximum amount of essential oils we can mix in any one blend. 
according to the ITEC regulations. So as we're doing ITEC exam, that's what we're going to stick to. The dilutions are always going to be a maximum of two drops in any five mil of carrier oil. No more than eight drops in any one treatment. We can increase the carrier oil, but we're not going to increase the essential oils for a larger client. Babies and the elderly, we would only use one drop of essential oils to five to 10 mils of carrier. For the face, we might use one drop of essential oil to maximum. We're going to blend the carrier oil in a plastic cup. So we're going to bring the cup up to eye height and we're going to pour the carrier oils label facing the ceiling so that if we do dribble the oil down the label, it's not going to obscure the label so that we can't read what it is. So the label's going to be face up. The plastic cap's going to be at eye level. I don't want to see anybody pouring oils down on the table so they can't really see what the mills are that they're putting in. If you're going to have 5% of something else, it's very difficult to measure 5% specifically. So we're going to put a little dash or a little dribble in the bottom of the cup first. And we're going to do that if we have more than one or two 5% oils. We're going to put a little dash, little dribble in the bottom of the cup first. Then we're going to bring the cup up to eye height and we're going to top it up to exactly how many mils we're going to use for this treatment. And when it comes to writing it up, you do need to put in, you can put in 5% avocado, you can put in 5% evening primrose or whatever it is you've added, but you must state how many mils you've used finally in your blend. So what have you topped it up with? Use the right oils for the right conditions. So we're going to need to justify why we've used the different carrier oils. You might say I've used 5% because my client is menopausal or has PMT. You might say I'm going to use 5% of wheat germ because my client's got scarring. But you do have to justify why you are using the carriers and you do have to say their Latin name. Do make sure you replace the lids after you've used them. Store them in a cool place and use the oldest first. And the essential oil ratio, which you will need to know the percentages, is 1% is a weaker blend, 2% is a stronger blend, 2.5% is the maximum blend, and 1% equals one drop in five mils. So you will need to know those ratios.